Welcome to Future Docs Podcast. My name is Pedram Mizani. I'm a family physician, chief clinical officer at AC Medical, and your co-host of Future Docs Podcast. And I'm your other co-host, Cody Fan. I am a healthcare writer and editor at AC Medical. Since 2007, our team at AC Medical has helped over a thousand future docs become licensed U.S. physicians, and they're treating 20,000 patients daily. So we wanted to share our success with you. Every week, we interview physicians and other experts asking them for tips and secrets that will save you time and help you avoid mistakes as you compete to be the next future doc in the United States. Episode one, future docs with and without residency interviews. This episode is specifically targeted for all future docs participating in the annual U.S. main match with and without residency interviews. Today's episode will be broken down into three key components. Those with six or more residency interviews, those with fewer than six residency interviews, and those without residency interviews. Now, the reason why this topic matters at this time of the year is that this is the time that we all work towards. And this is when we want to see the fruits of our labor. In a normal match season, January is when we begin to see all the interviews kind of slow down and they start to taper off by early February. And as this cycle was affected by COVID-19 pandemic and the later start of October 21st. We saw a little bit of transition with dates being shifted forward by about uh, three to five weeks. However, in a timeline fashion, it's now time to review what to do next. And with that, Dr. Bazzani, I would like to first get your insights on what should future docs with fewer than six residency interviews do, as I'm sure you have tips that overlap all three groups. Correct. Anyone that participates in the match should be planning for the moment that they find out that they do not match. So regardless if you have zero, six, or 16 interviews, you should really be planning to prepare for match week supplemental offer and acceptance program. There are a few other things that you should also be doing if you have greater than zero interviews and less than six. If they're all in the same specialty, one of the lowest hanging fruit is to contact each one of the programs that you apply to and you haven't heard back from. Just keep in mind that these residency programs, as they're going through your applications, they're also attending to patients with, with COVID and the hospitals are inundated. Our healthcare system is being overwhelmed. And so there's a lot of delays, a lot of unexpected delays in how these applications are being viewed. We're still seeing interviews be offered in January, so it's not too late to contact each one of the programs. So that's what I would do if you have fewer than six interviews. Got it. And just so that we can direct it towards the rank order list as well, with fewer than six, of course, or 16, the rank order list is always something that should come into mind when it comes to the match cycle. Could you kind of share your insight as to what differentiates if you have fewer than six and then 16 and so on? So the rank order list is your preference. And it's the same for residency programs preference as well. They'll rank all of the candidates that they want to potentially see at their program. They don't have to rank everyone. And you do the same thing. And you could put six or 16 programs that you interviewed at, or you could just select, you know, four or five of those six programs and only rank those. Of course, that's not recommended. We are not in the driver's seat. We need to match into a residency. So if you've had six interviews and you attended all six, there has to be a catastrophic thing that happened that you would not rank those programs, but certainly you want to go ahead and rank all of them. So that's what a rank order list does. Once you submit it towards the end of February is when the certification of your rank order list needs to take place. Once you certify it, that is it. You're submitting your rank order list to the match algorithm. And the match algorithm will go ahead and compare your ranks to those of the residency programs, the numbers ones and ones match. And then if you're lower on their rank order list, but they were number on one on yours, then of course you are temporarily matched to that program unless there's another candidate that has rank that program higher and the program has also ranked them higher. And this process will just keep going and going and going until all the options are exhausted. And those that remain at the end of this rank quarter list algorithm, the unmatched programs are those that participate in supplemental offer and acceptance program as unmatched programs. And candidates that do not match through the rank quarter list have to, they have the option of participating in supplemental offer and acceptance program during match week if they are so eligible. Now that leads me to a plethora of questions for you. First and foremost, I noticed that you 
mentioned for the rank or less needs to be submitted by February. I'm starting to get a lot of emails from our members, and I also want to just reach out to the listeners as well. When should they start catering the rank order list? You said that programs are still sending interviews out. What is the timeline for that? Rank order list is something that is organic and you should constantly be reevaluating where you are ranking the programs that you've interviewed at. If you're fortunate enough to have secured several interviews and several, I mean, more than six in the same specialty, then of course you probably have your favorite and then you have your least favorite. And so that list is there. The more programs that you interview at, the more that this rank order list is going to change. However, there are many factors that go into the changes that you implement into your rank order list before you certify them. So you want to wait till absolutely the final date before you certify your rank order list. And that date will change. Uh, every year. So I recommend you to go to NRMP's website, take a look at the schedule of dates and see when the NRMP rank order list deadline is the year that you are watching and hearing this podcast. I also want to pick your brain a little bit more about SOAP. You, you mentioned whether regardless of six or 16 interviews, you heavily recommend SOAP. Can I ask why? And is this something that those without residency interviews should look into as well. Absolutely. Anybody with multiple interviews is a great candidate for SOAP. You know, anybody with less than six interviews is also a great candidate for SOAP. And I'm going to talk about those with no interviews in just a moment. And the reason why you all are great candidates for SOAP is because you were able to attract the attention of residency programs, enough of them so that they would offer you interviews. And so most likely your ERS application is presentable. Most likely your letters of recommendation are okay. And most likely your MSP and other supporting documents are going to hold up well. Those that have no interviews, you fall into two categories. Those that have not applied and are just purely preparing for SOAP, you're in a pretty good shape because that means that you have January and February to really get your clinicals in order, to really get your letters of recommendation in order, and to get some professional advice on how to put your ERAS together. Because once you certify your ERAS application, you cannot change it. So if you have not submitted your ERAS application and hopefully you have not certified it, that means that you can still change it. You're in a pretty good shape. You can, you know, we can really, really help you. And if you don't seek our help, seek in a professional's advice. But those of you that have already certified your ERS application and have gotten zero interviews, we would need to take a look at your ERS application to see what it is that we're dealing with. Still, if you've certified your application, you paid for supplemental offer and acceptance program, you should take advantage of it. You've already paid for it. You should take advantage of it. And just if you want to know how effective SOAP is, every year, anywhere between 1,000 to 1,700, 1,800 candidates match into SOAP. About 20% to 25% that changes every year are international medical graduates. The rest are U.S. medical graduates. So very, very effective. I'm going to push you just a little bit more about SOAP without residency interviews. I know that I know that you said there are two key groups for those that have already certified their application and therefore do not have in residency interviews just because of maybe something with their application. While there's another group for those that have certified and do not have residency interviews as well. For those that have certified already, you said that there's very little that can be changed. Can we just clarify a little bit more what can be changed when it comes to SOAP and what can members do now or listeners do now as they prepare for SOAP or as they want to garner last minute interviews as well? So in your ERAS application, only the personal information section can be changed. You cannot change your experiences. You cannot change your hobbies. You cannot change you know, all of the areas that really makes you you. But the contact information, phone number, address, you know, that area, the personal information section can be changed, but the really, really important stuff cannot. The other things that can be changed are your supporting documents, which are your letters of recommendation, your personal statement, and your medical student performance evaluation. Now, if you've already submitted four letters of recommendation to a program that is listed as unmatched and it has unfilled slots, then you cannot submit any more letters of recommendation but you've submitted three and you see the program, you've applied to it, you can still submit one more letter of recommendation. Most people do not apply to every program that exists. And so that's probably your case as well. So you probably have not applied to that program, or if you have, you probably have not submitted four letters of recommendation. So that's one area that you can change. 
The other thing is your MSBE. And a lot of people are under the impression that MSB cannot be changed. MSBE can be changed. And whenever you upload a new MSB, it overrides the previous one and it is instantaneous. And so it is a fantastically important document that you can upload and make any corrections to with the help of your dean's office. And, and you will get a lot of points for that. MSB is really, really critical. And of course, your personal statement. A lot of areas where you fell short during the regular match, you can make up during the, in your personal statement. And if you cannot change your ERAS, you can talk about your updates in your personal statement as well. I've even seen people put update section within their personal statement specifically for SOAP just to get some wow. more information. And I thought that that was kind of creative as well. That is very creative. That's actually the first that I've heard of that. I want to transition this a little bit into why is it that we have our three key breakdowns surrounded by the magic number of six residency interviews? So when you look at charting matches outcomes, you can look at, you know, either it's broken down by all specialties and then it's broken down by individual specialties. And when you look at all specialties or individual, you'll see that, some of the specialties, the number of unmatched to the number of matched, whenever you see that the number of matched to unmatched is about even, that's the number of interviews that you would say that you need in order to be considered for odds to statistically work in your favor. So whenever you see the unmatched and the match go even, and then the match just slightly goes up, that's the number that you want to be in. It's typically one interview over where they are equal. So for emergency medicine, that number is pretty high. It's not six. That number is like 12. For family medicine and internal medicine, that number is, you know, six, seven. It varies year by year. But so six was an average number to give you an idea of, hey, you need to be at this number. And if you're not, you got to do something about it more rapidly than you would have otherwise. That's something that we'll also be covering in episode two, last minute interviews. Just going to give a little sneak peek of that. But just so that I can understand now, because that is actually news to me. Emergency medicine requires on average 12. So six is just the average number that you were able to aggregate as you've done your years of expertise and experience as well. Yeah, six has been the number. And of course, for U.S. medical seniors, by default, most of them are going to get interviews at 80% of the programs that they apply to. So they'll by default have you know, 12, 13, 15 interviews. So that's usually not an issue. But if you're a an international medical student or graduate listening and watching us, then it's a lot harder for you to secure interviews. You, just like myself, have to apply to 10 times the number of programs simply because our medical school was not located here in the United States. And when we apply to 10 times the number of programs, we'll probably end up with about a third of the number of interviews if there is nothing really glaringly wrong with our application. So it depends on your background. It depends on where your medical school is located. It depends on red flags in your application and whether in the first 30 seconds of looking at your entire ERS application package, you know, we're going to continue looking at it. And the next thing I wanted to bring up, Dr. Mazzani, you mentioned with all three groups, SOAP is a must. Of course, it has to do with statistics. You mentioned that six being the magic number off the statistical data that we've seen, what kind of motivation can you give for those who have that confidence of, I've received 12 interviews, SOAP isn't something I should look into. What do you say to those future docs? Number one, I match through Scramble. Scramble was the earlier iteration of SOAP. So I'm a huge believer I would not be here if it was not because of Match Week's unfilled programs and how they get matched to unmatched candidates. Number one. Number two, in the past 20 years that I've been working with residency candidates, every year, without fail, someone with over 15 interviews always end up not matching. Of course, they were not prepared for it. They were overly confident that they were going to match, so they didn't even have a plan or strategy for supplemental offer and acceptance program. And it's really hard to help them that Monday of match week. So SOAP is going to work best for those that have prepared for SOAP, meaning they've updated their letters of recommendation, meaning they've taken out any gaps between the time they submitted their application and 
match week. That means that they continued in clinical sites where they came in contact with patients. That means that their personal statements are updated. And that also means that they know what specialties could potentially go unfilled and how realistic is it for the specialty that they apply to, to show up as an unfilled position within match. Because if you apply to, let's say neurology, and there are not that many neurology programs that are going to go unmatched, what is your plan B? So having that plan B in place and preparing for it as of November, December, January will put you in a much, much better position. And that's what I'm advocating. Now that you covered all three groups of future docs participating in this year's main match cycle, if you could summarize the main points you would like listeners to just take home. Don't be overconfident. If you have interviews, prepare for soap. If you do not have any interviews, that does not necessarily mean that you're a bad candidate. All of these things that we're saying, half of us being able to get interviews has to do with luck as well. Most of the programs that don't offer us interviews is not because our application is bad. It's because there's just not enough slots or it's humanly impossible for one person or two people to go through 5,000 applications. So don't give up. Don't lose hope. And if this soap does not work out for you, then you preparing for soap puts you in a much better position for next year's match because you've already gotten one to two months of clinical rotations out of the way. That means one to two letters of recommendation for next year's match. Any letter of recommendation from this year works really well for this year's match. So that works out in your favor. And when you won't have to deal with the bottleneck of everyone trying to get clinical experience, but when I say everyone, I mean everyone trying to get clinical experience, trying to get letters of recommendation. Cody, you remember, you know, it, it yeah. gets to be a mess in some of the clinical sites where so many people are requesting letters of recommendation in August and September, and some don't get it because they waited for so long. So, you know, avoid the bottleneck, prepare now, don't lose the opportunity of preparing for supplemental offer and acceptance program. And ask for help, ask for expert help, ask for expert mentors who've gone through supplemental offer and acceptance program or scramble and they succeeded. And so that's what I recommend to you all. And again, I just want to reiterate, take action now. Don't wait until the bottleneck starts. As Dr. Manzani mentioned himself, he himself has matched to scramble in the past. With that being said, don't be discouraged from taking this opportunity at SOAP. You've already paid for it. If you've applied through the main match to all the naysayers, don't let them take your air opportunity away from you. It's worth a shot. Keep at it. And we're here to assist you if you need help for all of our future docs. With that, thank you for your time, Dr. Mazzani. If you have any questions, just contact us at info at acmedical.org. See you for episode two. See you in episode two. Thank you, Cody.